Okay, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining another webinar of the European Young Chemist Network, EYCN, and the International Younger Chemist Network, IYCN. In this edition, we're also specifically supported by one of our member societies, uh, the Young Chemist Network of the German Chemical Society. My name is Martina Menche, and I'm the secretary of the European Young Chemist Network. And together with uh, Giovanna Milic, I will be hosting today's session. And I briefly want to start by giving some background on our net two networks the European Young Chemist Network and the International Young Chemist Network. The EYCN um, is the umbrella organization of the National Young Chemist Networks in Europe. And in this role provides a platform for international exchange of ideas, projects, but also knowledge and experience among 30 national societies in 28 countries. This role is also reflected in joint events like this one today, or other joint projects like the Sustainability and Education Survey that lays the foundation for today's webinar. Furthermore, we want to provide early career researchers with various kinds of support. A recent example of these initiatives, the workshops we hosted as part of our recent online event that replaced the eighth UCAM Chemistry Congress in Lisbon, which had to be moved in, uh, to 2020, uh, 2022 due to the ongoing pandemic, or the Totalysis Talks webinar series that offers early career researchers a place to present their research and extend their skill in this conference free time. Last but not least, we believe that the discussion and education on important chemical topics should not only be done amongst chemists, but also uh, should be extended to informing the general public about scientific facts instead of fake, any fake news. Uh, and therefore we hosted multiple outreach competitions uh, of which our latest called uh, Photochemica, which was hosted together with the Royal Society of Chemistry uh, featured sustainable development and the topic. Moving to the International Younger Chemists Network, which was officially launched as an associate member organization of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, or in short, and probably better known, IUPAC, in 2017, the main focus has moved from Europe to the rest of the world. The IYCN, with its global diverse networks, supporting and advocating for younger scientists working across chemical sciences towards a globally sustainable future. Uh, this includes outreach activities like a chemical experiment database available in dozens of languages uh, free of charge or a currently ongoing outreach campaign concerning the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Recently, the IOSCN, together with IUPAC, has also established the Chem Voices webinar platform under the slogan Showcasing the Future of Chemistry. Um, and this platform features uh, various webinars from, from the past month. Uh, for example, on, on collaboration or um, employment topics uh, important to, to early career scientists. For more information on uh, these critical uh, topics, uh, please see our websites at eycn.eu and iycnglobal.com uh, and also consider to follow the social media channels to stay up to date. Uh, today's webinar is on uh, the uh, sustainability in education survey that was carried out together by the European, uh, the European Young Chemist Network, the International Young Chemist Network, and the uh, Young Chemist Network of German Chemical Society, uh, JCF, um, which um, will be shortly uh, introduced by, by Emil in a second. Uh, so with that, I will uh, move over to our first speaker of today. Uh, who is one of the driving forces behind this sustainability and education survey as part of his, his role in the German Young Chemist Network. So, uh, Emil Doblar is a PhD student in bioinorganic chemistry at uh, TU Kaiserslautern in Germany. And he joined the German Chemical Society and its uh, Young Division in 2015. Since then, he has taken over various responsibilities and uh, recently, or uh, has, has made the move to the federal board of the JCF in 2019. And then finally to the position as, as chairman of the board um, more recently in late 2020. Uh, Emil, with that, um, please uh, go ahead in, in starting, uh, or let me stop my screen share first, uh, and then you're starting uh, to share your screen and uh, present the interesting stuff. Yeah, uh, welcome everybody and thank you very much for the nice introduction, Max. Let me see if I can get this started. So if you can, if, uh, you can just give me a feedback if you can see this. 
Yeah, I can see it. Uh, everything's good. Okay, perfect. So yeah, Max has said a few words about me already. Thank you very much for that. Um, you can see uh, I'm currently the chairman of the German Young Chemist Network. I'll say a few words about that uh, in a second, but I'm also a PhD student in inorgan uh, inorganic chemistry uh, with Professor hans jörg Krüger at TU Kaiserslautern in Germany, where I work on topics uh, as bioinorganic chemistry and uh, also some magnetochemistry. The German Young Chemist Network, uh, the Jung Chemiker Forum, is a youth organization of the German Chemical Society, and it is uh, structured kind of similar to what Max explained about the EYCN and the IYCN. The German Young Chemist Network was established in 1997, and we have approximately 10,000 members. Um, this is uh, a little bit lower right now because of the COVID-19 situation, um, as we live a lot from uh, in-person events. But uh, nonetheless, we're still a lot of people and we have national and international activities and now also online events. And we've recently founded individual teams for hot topics and one of that is sustainability. We also have local sections across Germany who uh, organize online and local events uh, as soon as possible again. And uh, we work closely with our international and national partners and networks such as the EYCN and the IYCN for uh, information exchange, joint projects, and personal development. Now, as I said, we have a focal team on the on sustainability. That's called the JCF Team Sustainability, which we recently founded in 2020 only. And since then, we've worked on several projects that you can find uh, on our homepage under the link below or the QR code if you like to scan that. We worked on sustainability guidelines for young chemist networks, also with EYCN and IYCN, then also in an international cooperation on a white paper on sustainable developments and what young chemists think about that, especially in the context of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, also, as Max has addressed, the webinar is about the survey sustainability and chemical education now. So how did we get to the point that we wanted to do a survey about sustainability and education? Well, you can think about this. We wanted to start a sustainability action in the Young Chemist Network. And then we had to think, where are we still lacking something uh, at this moment uh, in general? And where will people listen to us? Because you can pick out any sustainability topic that you want, but you also need people to uh, respect your opinion and you need to have a certain expertise on this. And I guess our networks are very close to chemical education and we can have a say about that. And it's something that is often overlooked. So a little disclaimer at the beginning, uh, we posed all these questions via an open access Google form and shared that via uh, the, yeah, the joint networks and we gathered the responses anonym anonymously. We did this for about two months and checked regularly if there were any irregularities, but there was nothing found. So there was no one hacking us and sending in a ton of replies. So for the workup, um, since this was uh, distributed strongly through the German network, we had roughly half of the responses from Germany. Uh, and we also had a survey in German language. So for the workup, we translated that and uh, we'll compare this separately. And it's also important to uh, look at the statistics who participated so you can see it in context and that these replies are merely a snapshot and not actually scientific results, but uh, still important information. So first question, who participated? Well, a number of participates, uh, participants that we had were roughly 500 people from 46 countries. And uh, as you can see here on the right down below, uh, we have a fairly strong uh, representation of Europe. So keep that in mind when you look at the, at the following results. The age of the participants was a maximum of 40. Most of them were well below that, as you can see from the graphics. So where are we standing now? That was the first thing we wanted to know. So first question, how's the adequacy of sustainable chemistry in education? Uh, so how is the quality of that? What is being thought? Uh, taught. And you can see here that, uh, well, we viewed Germany separately as we have a huge chunk of German participants. Maybe we can view this as a representative 
country for uh, for Europe. Maybe not. That is for you to decide. But uh, internationally, the adequacy of sustainable uh, sustainable chemistry is um, it's all right, but uh, we can do better, I guess. And in Germany, it's actually not that good. And you can see there are also uh, some people that uh, responded and said it's uh, bad or even non-existent. So there's uh, something that is uh, alarming. Next uh, question relevant for the industry. Do uh, young chemists actually gain skills to uh, forward uh, sustainability strategy of in, uh, industry. And you can see here that uh, internationally over 30% and in Germany even over 50% are not satisfied with the skills they gain for industry. They do wanna to contribute to the uh, sustainability strategy of a company, but uh, they feel like they don't get the tools and, uh, and the skills that they need. So this is also uh, very alarming. Next question. Um, is basically what is what about the future? How can we change or what do young chemists want? And you can see here the chart of the of the world is uh, a lot more green. It's very clear answer. Uh, many young chemists want a more detailed uh, sustainable chemistry education in the future. And uh, yeah, it's quite overwhelming. You can say almost everybody uh, everybody says there has to happen something. We need more sustainable chemistry in future education. Now, uh, last question that we posed was, um, is the sustainability strategy of a company relevant, a relevant factor for you when choosing a career? And also here you can see a very clear answer. So this is a message to industry. If you do wanna uh, acquire talent to bring forward your sustainability strategy, you need to have one. So uh, young chemists are actually looking for that and uh, the best talents will probably go to those that uh, work towards sustainability. And with that, I wanna close the presentation. I'll post a link in the chat uh, once I'm done. So you can look at the slides individually on our homepage if you wanna post uh, specific questions so you can have a closer look. I know this was a quite quick uh, presentation, um, but I wanna acknowledge um, yeah, my partner in crime, Chris Heinz, who is my co-leader of the JCF team sustainability and the federal board member and all the people that helped work up the results and especially also the EYCN and the IYCN for uh, this nice collaboration. And with that, I think I can uh, give it back to Max. Uh, thank you, Emil. I mean, this is uh, perfect timing. Uh, we just got the question in the, in the chat uh, whether the... Um, these findings can be found um, and, and will be shared. So this would be the perfect opportunity for you, for you to put the link in. Yeah, there it is. Um, so if you um, want to look um, at these slides, you can do it uh, online now. And also, um, if you then have any more specific um, questions on, on some of these, um, these things, uh, Emil will probably be very happy to answer them uh, later. Um, if, if there are any questions already now, from this uh, very quick view of, um, of these slides, either from the panelists or from the attendees. Um, please um, come up with them quite quickly, otherwise we will move on and give you the chance to ask these questions later on. Ah, okay, so <laughs> um, maybe we use this time right at the beginning of the webinar, which we wanted to do a, a little bit earlier which is um, from uh, Klaus Kümmerer, who asks, what is your understanding of sustainable, uh, sustainable chemistry, synonym to green chemistry or different? Uh, where are the respondents aware of this issue? Emil. Um, I, we didn't specifically raise awareness to the differences in sustainable chemistry and green chemistry. And my understanding is that sustainable chemistry is a much more broad term and green chemistry is just an aspect of that with its 12 disciplines. But uh, maybe Natalie actually wants to uh, say a few words about that. 
Sure. So I, I know here in, in, so I am here in the United States. I'm joining from New York here. Um, I do know that green chemistry is a term that we use, but the goal for the term of green chemistry is for that green to drop away. And it's just the way that we do chemistry, but green chemistry has principles. And I see green chemistry as falling underneath the umbrella of sustainable chemistry, that sustainability is a big, broad topic that we need to have an interdisciplinary approach to, but that chemists can work actively through the green chemistry principles to achieve sustainable sustainability through their work and therefore then work towards those goals of sustainable chemistry overall. So that would be my response, but I'd love to hear others' feedback. Okay, thank you, Emil and, and Natalie for these insights. Um, there is another question that fits uh, really well right now for the survey, which is from uh, Bas Tuenta, uh, who asks, will the results be uh, also be presented to university boards so that they can take action with this knowledge? Uh, yeah, sure. You're welcome to take these to the university boards. At this moment, um, we're uh, working together with the German uh, Chemical Society for new recommendations of the curriculum chemistry, where we have representatives from the German Young Chemist Network that try to help implement this. But uh, yeah, if you like, uh, you're welcome to, to do so. I don't think we can target every university uh, specifically. So anyone who's attending and they know where to find the results, I'm happy to share. Okay, I think uh, with that, it's a, a good uh, opportunity to move on to our next speaker, who you already just heard uh, a few seconds ago. Uh, so um, this is um, Dr. Natalie O'Neill, and she has earned her PhD from, from State University of New York uh, at Albany. Um, in 2016, um, and during that time, she felt that uh, sustainability and environmental impacts were uh, generally left out in the, let's say, classical chemistry curriculum and uh, started to, to engage this topic uh, somewhat herself. And afterwards, she joined uh, Utica College as an assistant professor. And in this time also became the executive director of, at the uh, network of the of early career sustainable scientists and engineers, or uh, NESI for short. And uh, nowadays, she's a higher education program manager at Beyond Benign, um, which we uh, will truly tell us a little bit more about right now. And, and with that, I want to hand over to you, Natalie. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. So hi, I'm Natalie O'Neill, the Higher Education Program Manager from Beyond the Nine, and I am going to give you just a little bit of a, I think that chemists hold the power to create a sustainable future if we think about what chemists do and how we function. Um, and so what I really want to say is that when we decide what we are going to do in the lab, through our laboratories, in our education, we are really deciding human health and environmental impacts because all the research that we're doing, the things that we are learning end up being the products and processes that are around us every day. So with this great power of being the makers of the molecules, we really have a great responsibility. And I believe that comes from the fact that the chemical products around us every day, that people are consuming these. And so it comes back to us needing to be thinking about human health and environment from the very beginning. And so this really ties into this idea of if we want to achieve these sustainable development goals, chemistry has a role to play in all of these. And we need to be thinking about sustainability from the very beginning of this. And so for me, sustainability through chemistry is practicing green chemistry. And this is through a set of principles that were founded in 1998 by Dr. Paul Anastas and Dr. John Warner. They wrote the formative text. There's a nice book here. It's actually right here on my desktop. It's a short little book about green chemistry, the principles and practices. But really the takeaway here is that if we think about hazard from the very beginning, when we set out to do our chemistry, that we can therefore have less risk associated with that chemistry. So if upfront we are thinking about the hazards, thinking about the environmental impacts, that we can then have a less risk of having problems in the future and also work towards that sustainability that we're thinking at the molecular level about sustainability. And the way we do that as a chemist is through the 12 principles of green chemistry. And so I'm not going to dive too much into these, but just to say that these are 12 principles that are very much in the language of chemists. 
right? If you're looking at this, you can see catalysis, right? That's a thing we're very familiar with. There may be terms that you're not as familiar with, like atom economy. But thinking about atoms and economy, it's how are those atoms used in the reaction? Do they stay in the reaction? Are they effectively and efficiently used or are they not incorporated into the synthesis? And then of course you can see safer is a term that's on here many times. So thinking about safer chemicals from the very beginning, safer solvents, designing to have a reduced environmental and human health impact through the principles. And so I do just want to connect this to the uh, sustainable development goals that they are associated here and that there really is a demand um, from the uh, consumers for companies to start shifting in this way and that green chemistry really plays into a lot of the sustainability initiatives such as circular economy, the ocean plastics problems that we see, the United Nations development goals, as I just mentioned, the associated ones, and then climate change overall, right? If we're thinking from the very beginning how to reduce our environmental impact, then on the macro scale, we're going to have um, a better impact overall. And so I will just say that this is something that is uh, not a new topic, but definitely something that's gaining a lot of attention right now that we need to shift towards this circular economy in the future. And this paper came out in Science in 2020 um, from Dr. Zimmerman from the University of Yale. And if you take a look at where we're moving for tomorrow's sector, those are very much the green chemistry principle terms that you just saw in the 12 principles. And so there's really a call from industry right now. So this is DuPont and their 2030 sustainability goals. Number three is that they're designing 100% of their products and processes using sustainability criteria, including the principles of green chemistry. So it's really important that we understand the principles of green chemistry and can functionally use them because there are many industries, DuPont is just one example, but there are many companies and industries out there that are looking for um, incoming workforce to have these skills so that they can achieve their sustainability goals. And so I want to tell you a little bit about the work that I do at Beyond Benign and Beyond Benign in general. It's a nonprofit organization that is based in the United States. It was founded in 2007 by Dr. John Warner, one of the founders of the field of green chemistry, and also Dr. Amy Cannon, who holds the world's first green chemistry PhD. And our mission is really is dedicated to green chemistry education and the community. So we want to empower educators to transform chemistry education uh, for a sustainable future, that we really truly believe that if green chemistry is not a fundamental skill that chemists have in the future, that we cannot get to a place where we have products and processes around us every day that are healthy and safe for humans and the environment. And so just to tell you a little bit about Beyond Benign and what we do, we work across the education continuum from K through 12 to higher education. And so we started in 2007 and now we are here in 2021. And I'll tell you a little bit about my work in higher education, but we do have a across the spectrum. Um, I say our K through 12 team is absolutely amazing and there are tons of resources there, but I will focus a little bit more on our higher education work um, given the audience that we have today. So I do wanna say that really the goal of the term of green chemistry is that that term just drops away and that this is just the way that we practice chemistry, that when we set out to do chemistry, we think from the very beginning about those environmental and human health impacts and we do that through the principles. And we have on our website a ton of ways to get started. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our green chemistry commitment, but what I also wanna highlight is that Beyond the Nine really sees students as change agents, that students have the power to create meaningful change and on your campus and on your community. And so there are resources right on our website of ideas of how you can bring this to um, your institution with a green chemistry um, chapter, student group, um, or exploring things a little bit more and talking about resources that you could bring into your um, institution. So all of the resources that are created um, by Beyond Benign we are with the community. They are open access. So all of the resources are open access and free for anyone to take, adapt, use as they wish. We'd love to hear how people are using them, um, but they really is a open access place to lower the barrier to integrating green chemistry into chemistry curriculum. And so I will say that we have a full green chemistry university curriculum course could be a semester long course or it could be used in bits and pieces, but it's got everything from um, PowerPoints to supplemental readings to case studies, um, the green chemistry presidential challenge awards that are 
based here in the United States that have been around um, since 1996 um, or Yes, 1996, um, are also a part of this and are great examples of how green chemistry is used in everyday real world examples. Um, so this is a free and open access curriculum that was created um, in collaboration with the Center for Green Chemistry and the Green um, Engineering at Yale. Um, that can also be found on our website. So the resources are out there. If you are looking to use them, they are definitely there. Um, and I just wanna talk about something that can be done by institutions is called the Green Chemistry commitment. And the Green Chemistry Commitment is fostered by Beyond the Nine. It's a consortium program. It really aims to expand the community of green chemists, grow departmental resources that want to focus on sustainability, but really to share best practices in green chemistry education and to systematically change the way that we teach chemistry so that we are teaching chemists to think about the environment and human health from the very beginning. Um, so we do have the commitment started in 2013. We currently have 75 signers globally and across the range of institutions, so from R1s all the way down to community colleges. And they agree that it's, students need to learn about green chemistry and that there are four student learning objectives. So the theory, the principles, they need to learn about toxicology. So you can't do safer chemistry if you don't understand toxicology. And this is one of the biggest gaps that chemists have right now is understanding the toxicological effects of the chemistry that they do and the molecules that they use. Um, so there's whole programs around Beyond Benign and working groups around toxicology as well. Laboratory skills, so being able to identify which chemical is safer, which which should I use and making the adjustments? And then that application. So the application of taking green chemistry and then furthering it on sustainable chemistry, how do you interact with the larger um, network overall? And so I wanna say we have those 75 signers, please, if you are an institution or you are at an institution that is not a signer, please come join us. It's open, it's free for everyone to join. And I'm excited to say that news has gone out from TU Berlin that they have signed on. They are the first European Union to sign on to the Green Chemistry Commitment. They've shared that news. We'll be sharing it later on today through our uh, social media platforms. So if you are at that institution, please share and celebrate that news with us. We're really excited to have TU Berlin joining on and to see what they are doing in terms of their green chemistry and sustainable chemistry education. Um, so I do want to just give you a map that there are 75 signers. They are distributed. Of course, we are based in the United States, started in the United States. So we are a little US centric right now, but we are looking to expand the commitment and invite anyone to join us that would um, benefit from doing so. Um, there are opportunities, so why, why sign on to the GCC? Is that really collective voice, that there is this movement that we need to move towards for sustainable uh, products in the process, in the future, that we need chemists to have these skills, tracking projects, shaping the commitment, working on teams. Um, we have webinars all of the time, that green chemistry curriculum, using it, adding to it, and then networking and collaborating within the field as well. Uh, I will just mention quickly that we have case studies on our signers, so examples of what they are doing on their campuses um, that can be accessed as well. Um, and just an example here of the University of Toronto, just to show you in terms of the idea of adopting green chemistry is not something that's going to happen overnight. Sustainable chemistry education is not something that's going to happen overnight. It's going to be a process. It's going to take time. Change takes time. Um, but here the University of Toronto has a paper that they released in 2019 about their department and a systems thinking approach to how they're teaching chemistry. And it's this culture of green chemistry and practice. But if you look at the this timeline, they've been thinking about this since 2005. And so it's this idea that the Green Chemistry Commitment Program is really to foster, we're always getting greener, we're always working and learning um, how we can do better in sustainable education. So I do just wanna leave with two things, um, just an announcement, I guess, to let you know that the ACS GCI and Beyond Benign have come together and will be working on a three-year project, which is called the Green Chemistry Teaching and Learning Community. We're very much in the start of this. And if there are any kind of feedback, if you have interest in an online community that focuses on green chemistry, please reach out and engage with us um, around this initiative. I'm sure you'll be hearing uh, more about it um, in our 
promotion of it, but I will say too that we invite you to our monthly meetings, that we have Green Chemistry Connections. They're two hours. It's always the second Wednesday of the month. It is open to anyone to join. Um, we have an online kind of place to discuss, share resources as well. Um, and so I invite you to engage with the community. And I'd just like to kind of leave you off on the, I had a lovely introduction here and maybe it sounds like it's a straight path. It definitely was not. And you, if you don't have sustainability in your place, in your department, seek it out, find the resources that you need to go where you want to go. Um, from that survey, what I heard was that you want to have sustainable futures in your careers, then you need to pick up those skills along the way if they're not necessarily in your program. So I say, um, find what you need, you hold the power. Um, and uh, with that, I will say thank you so much for your time. And I'm open to questions now or during the panel discussion. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Uh, we, we've got one uh, shout out in the in the chat from uh, Martin uh, Amel. I think he's uh, probably from, from TU Berlin from the timing when this came. Uh, so it seems like uh, the, the first step into Europe uh, is already paying off and uh, hopefully many more uh, institutions will join. Yes, definitely. It's great to have you and the family too, Martin. We're thrilled and we can't wait for more European unions to join us as well. Okay, then uh, let's move on to our third um, analyst. And the one month start. So yeah, um, our next speaker is is Juliana Vidal. Um, he, she did her um, undergraduate studies in chemistry in Brazil before then moving to. Memorial University of Newfoundland in Canada, uh, where she's currently pursuing her PhD studies. And in 2019, she started as an intern in Beyond B9 and um, has been uh, affiliated with them since, I think, as a graduate student uh, liaison. And uh, in, 2009, uh, in 2019, she also started as Director of Marketing and Communication and the Network of Early Career Sustainable Scientists and Engineers, so again, Nessie. Um, and uh, I would say some of this hard work and her engagement also shows um, by her selection as one of the 2020 uh, CAST Future Leaders, so the uh, Chemical Abstract Service of the American Chemical uh, Society. Um, and uh, Juliana, it's, Great that you are uh, with us today, and I would like to give the stage to you. Thank you very much, Max. I'm going to share my screen. Just a minute. Do, do, do. Hope you can see it. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction, Max, and thank you all for the invitation. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the NESI um, and what we've been doing with this organization. So Nessie started out of the Green Chem ACS Summer School in Green Chemistry and Sustainable Energy. I have the pleasure to participate in the 2019 edition. Um, I'm, I'm there in this picture, like it's a Where's Waldo thing, but I'm there. And uh, back in 2013, a woman called Jenny Dotson, which is our founding chair, she decided to like bring the excitement and the, the bonding created um, during the summer school to basically the whole world. So Nessie became a platform to connect um, scientists and researchers that are interested in sustainability. So Nessie stands for Network of Early Career Sustainable Science and then Engineers. That's why we call it Nessie, it's easier. Uh, and it's basically this movement of people who think about sustainability, who think about our environmental challenges and want to tackle them. So it's basically connecting all of these people around the world. So the mission of NASA is actually to inspire and mobilize these people. And I really like this word interdisciplinary because it shows like whenever talking about green chemistry, we need everybody on board to actually achieve what we want, achieve a sustainable future. And the strategic uh, priorities of NASA are basically to communicate, to engage people, to inspire them, to learn and um, make the changes we want and uh, we definitely need at this point. 
So in terms of what we're doing, um, we're serving, like we have in our blog, um, we have stories about scientists and what they're doing. And we also have our member spotlight where we get, this is Natalie, she was featured. And then we get to know like what people are doing in terms of research and also in terms of what they do in their daily lives because there's also too much going on. And also we have today 519 members. So if you want to join Nancy, I'm going to put a link of our website and everything you need to know. And we also have our local groups who are people who came together and want to, to change and want to, to um, do and sustain sustainable approaches and everything. And the GCI, which is the Green Chemistry Initiative as in the University of Toronto that Natalie mentioned, is also an Nancy local group. So it's just basically inspiring people to, to, to change. We are a free organization. We are uh, the members do it. It's for the members by the members. And these are our um, platforms on social media. So if you want to talk to us, if you want more information, if you want to participate, please get in contact with us. And this is also our website if you want to learn more about uh, the organization. So I'm going to leave with a very uh, philosophical ending, like uh, with this phrase, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use when creating them for, from Albert Einstein. In DID is basically we need change right now and we need to change the way we do chemistry, we need to change the way we teach chemistry, we need, we need to change the way we think and it's just uh, an invite, an invitation for you to actually be part of this change with us. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope I wasn't too quick and uh, that, that's it. Yeah, thank you, Juliana. Um, and we'll, we'll steadily move on with our panelists so that we can get to the uh, discussion um, at the end. So our next uh, speaker will be uh, Professor David Cole Hamilton. And uh, David, I would say, can, can look back on a on long and successful career in chemistry, um, in which after his uh, graduate studies in chemistry in, in Edinburgh, uh, he moved to, to London to work with uh, Sir Geoffrey Wilkinson and uh, his uh, interest in organometallic chemistry and homogeneous catalysis uh, has stayed with him ever since. Um, and in 1985, uh, he became a professor of chemistry at the University of St. Andrews um, and became an emeritus professor uh, nearly, rough, uh, nearly 30 years later in uh, 2014. Uh, and then in recent years, he has turned a lot of his attention to using bio-derived feedstocks or various catalytic processes um, and uh, important mention, of course, from, from our side at the European Young Chemist Network, has been a president of the European Chemical Society, UTEMS, from 2013 to 2017, and in his uh, subsequent term as uh, vice president of the society, has been leading the team that designed a new version of the periodic table. Um, he might show it today. Um, and um, I hope that most of you have anyways already seen that before, um, and David, we're looking forward to your coming. Thank you very much indeed, Max. It's a great pleasure to be here and I'm honored to be here. You'll notice I'm a bit different from all the other panelists in that I have white hair and I'm about three times their age. But I, I will, I'm still extremely interested in education and particularly in sustainability. So I want to talk a bit about what, what's happening and then maybe more also about educating the public as well as educating in schools and universities. So we come from uh, a past, which well, it's not really a past, we're still in it, where, with the, where we have had what we call a linear economy. We use things, we discard them, and that gets rid of resources and it causes pollution. And we've also powered that by using fossil fuels, which are uh, running out and also cause climate change. And we've also used a lot of what we call endangered elements in doing this kind of chemistry. And we have to go to a situation where we, sorry, I can't get rid of that thing at the top. Um, we have to go to a situation where uh, we're using renewable resources, particularly ones that have been grown because they're a continuous supply but then we have to worry about land use because we have to be concerned that we can eat enough. So we can't use just the land to make, res make resources for energy and chemicals and so on. We have to be worried about land use. And we have to change from using endangered elements to earth abundant elements. And we need to go from the linear economy to the circular economy as Natalie was talking about, where we repair things, we reuse them, we recycle them, 
And we don't just take the phone and every two years chuck it away and get a new one because then we waste all those wonderful resources that are in it. So we need to go to the circular economy. And my thesis is that it's going to be chemists and chemical engineers who are going to lead that forward. And that's why we have to teach them, or we want to teach them about sustainability and sustainable development. That comes in the context, and we've seen this again also from Natalie, of the 17 sustainable development goals, which have been put forward by the United Nations. Now, the question is, are we doing this? Are we doing anything about them? And the thing is, we, these sustainable development goals are for 2030. 2030 is only 10 years away. And a lot of people have not started to think about how they're going to deal with that. And this is where we have to start pushing and getting it into the education system. Now, a little bit about my background. Um, I started thinking about this sort of thing in 1976 when an undergraduate student at Imperial College came to me and said, can you make hydrogen from water using sunlight? And that started me on a research project which lasted for several years, making hydrogen from water and from alcohols. But then when he came to me, the oil price was very high. People were very interested in replacing fossil fuels because they were so expensive and because there was a worry about their lifetime. Uh, and then the oil price went down and people didn't get interested, so we did other things. But I started to give public lectures on replacing fossil fuels. Uh, as, sorry, yes, on replacing fossil fuels, but it wasn't really about global warming in those days. It was about lifetime and cost. And then gradually we became interested in global warming. The, the world became aware of it and started to think, well, are we really going to be able to carry on using these fossil fuels? So replacements became very important. And I gave a number of lectures over the years on the future of life on Earth when I looked at all the problems of sustainability, all the things that could make the, worth of the world collapse, and all of the areas in which chemistry could de deliver solutions to those problems. I've talked about pollution to a large extent more recently from 2000 onwards, and then we started to introduce undergraduate courses in these areas. I taught courses on climate change, green chemistry, atmospheric pollution, and always on catalysis, because I've done a lot of my work has been involved in catalysis. And then, as Max said, we've been researching recently the use of bio-oils as chemical feedstocks. They're renewable, and the ones we use are not ones which can be used as a food. They're byproducts of food production or of paper production, uh, and we've done a lot of work in that area. And then from 2018, again, we've talked a lot about element vulnerability and scarcity and more recently, the role of a chemist in a sustainable world. And basically, this article at the bottom here outlines all of what my thinking is in this area at the moment. And it's very, very similar to what Natalie was talking about, where she used almost the same title for her benign um, activities. And this is the periodic table that Max mentioned that we developed. Uh, it's quite different from any periodic table you've seen before. And this is because we need to to, to try and draw attention to something. This was developed for the International Year of the Periodic Table by a group at uh, the European Chemical Society. And we thought we, we need to have a, chemical, a periodic table which is different from ones that you normally look at. Normally, a lot of people, if you ask them if they heard about the periodic table, they say, oh, I think that was something in the back of a chemistry, chemistry lab when I was at school and it was a bit yellow and, and rather horrid and it smelled a bit. So, not, not, don't really know. And it's a grid of things with numbers in it, but I don't understand them. So we wanted to have a periodic table which is different, which has an impact, immediate visual impact, and looks completely different. And uh, so what we've done is we've developed, developed this one here. The area occupied by each element represents its abundance in the Earth's crust and in the atmosphere. And then the colors represent what we're doing to them. So if we take, as I was talking about a phone, we take phones and we throw them away, those elements become not available, particularly if you keep them in a drawer, which people often do when they get a new phone. And we looked at the lifetime that these elements will have if, if we do that, and they become much more difficult to get. So many of the ones in a mobile phone, and you can see the phone symbol here represents a, a mobile telephone, a smartphone. Many of them are red, which means they're going to run out within the next uh, 100 years. And four of them here are black, this means they come. They can come from conflict minerals, which come from places where wars are fought over the mines. 
So this is the kind of thing we need to do. So to get this into education, and this has actually proved to be very, very popular. It's been picked up by a number of schools, lots of schools in lots of different countries are using this now. And I believe we should bring this back into the university curriculum because it does address many of the green chemistry issues. And I would like just to mention four personal heroes, which I think are very important to have. The first one is Rachel Carson, who in 1962 published the book Silent Spring. At that time, that before that, there'd been huge deaths from malaria, particularly in, in the tropical regions. And DDT was introduced to as an anti malaria to wipe out the insects that carry malaria. It was overused and abused, and it turned out that birds were, birds were badly affected, and that's where this title comes from. There were no birds singing. So DDT was banned. So in 10 years after she wrote the book, DDT was banned. And the, dis the dif disadvantage of that is that malaria has risen again, new drugs are required. The other effect was <clears throat> the US Environmental Protection Agency was formed in 1970 as a direct result of this. And it has gone on to do amazing things in terms of all kinds of sustainability and environmental protection. The second is uh, the Paris Agreement, very important in uh, 2018, sorry, 2016. Uh, and we have to have most countries have committed to net zero emissions in 2050, but relatively slow progress until Greta Thunberg came along and she's made a huge difference. The school strikes for climate, worldwide activism, Extinction Rebellion is a spin off of that in the UK. And many governments have now suddenly up their game and are acting hard on uh, environmental emissions. And we can do that in sustainability. And David Attenborough is the third one I would highlight in his Blue Planet, Planet 2 series, starting in 2017, he highlighted a lot of problems in the oceans. And this picture you've also already seen from Natalie, it's in Manila Harbor, this is plastic. Massive problems with plastics and microplastics in the oceans. And then only two years later, the European Parliament, partly, almost really driven, I think, by David Attenborough, banned the use of single plastics. So really important to get role models out there talking about what we need to talk about and let's try to do that i'll stop there i may say a bit more about some of these things later on thank you very much okay thank you david for um, these really interesting uh, slides um, our uh, last of the five uh, panelists so uh, this is uh, Florian Engels. He did his bachelor's and master's degree in business chemistry at uh, Hochschule Fresenius and Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf, respectively. And uh, during this time, he already uh, was draw somewhat drawn to, to chemical industry as he joined the Bonnet, Lanxess and Bayer in various internships and also as a working student. Uh, and, and worked on various topics from innovation to market intelligence to uh, process technology. Uh, and um, after his undergraduate studies, he uh, joined the Bonnet full time as a PhD student working on corporate innovation, and also as a consultant on uh, sustainability. And um, yeah, also, uh, first up, we, we of course also have a long history with the Bonnet as, as EYCN was uh, actively supported. Uh, the networking is great to see um, Yvonne also contributing to, to this discussion um, and, and maybe highlighting some, some aspects that are uh, important to, to industry and to uh, getting the right talent um, into industry. So, um, Florian, please, um, we're looking forward to, to some comments from your side. Thanks for your introduction, Max. It's, uh... <laughs> I'm a little bit chucked out. It's fair that I'm winter because I never told you about my uh, my background. So yeah, <laughs> I have to check that again. Um, yes, my name is Florian. I work for Evonik, like Max um, said. I'm part of the lifecycle management group. So I'm doing lifecycle assessments and consulting um, the, the business lines and all other operations from Evonik regarding sustainability. And if you don't know, Evonik, we are a huge um, specialty chemical uh, um, corporate, and we um, are located in, uh, in, in Essen, so we are a German company. And like 
David and Natalie posted that there are some and that we are pointed at them, that we are placed them on the cross roads and that we are on the and we are um, going through a transformation. So a lot of sustainability topics and activities are going on right now. And then therefore it's quite interesting to see the results from the from the survey for us because we have a huge demand for, for people or for beginners from academic which help us and support sustainability within our company and within the whole industry of, of the chemical business. And therefore, I'm wondering what is the lack of um, the students facing the professionals skill that are missing and how we could maybe point education into the right direction that, they, that the people feel also skilled besides they are motivated of course, and sustainability and to drive sustainability um, ahead. And maybe like industry is going through a transformation, maybe also education has to um, adapt or has to evolve so more towards some sustainable chemistry um, education style. So that's for me at this point. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm sure there will be um, many questions uh, coming towards the direction of, of the industry's role um, uh, later on. Uh, and with that, I want to um, move over to the uh, last introduction that I have to give today. Um, and uh, that's uh, my co-host. So our panel discussion uh, will be moderated by, by Joanna Milic. Uh, she has obtained her PhD in chemistry from uh, ETH Zurich. Um, after, she, after that, uh, she moved on to work as a scientist at uh, EPFL with uh, Michael Gretzel, and uh, then uh, also joined the EYCN as networks team leader in 2019, and has been uh, leading uh, a lot of initiatives uh, for our network uh, since. Uh, similar to, to Juliana, she was also selected as a CAS future leader, but uh, one year prior in 2019. And uh, relatively recently, she moved uh, to a group leader position at the Adolphe Merkel Institute in Fribourg, Switzerland. And uh, Joanna, I'm happy to hand over the discussion to you. Well, thank you very much, Max, for this uh, kind introduction. And thank you to all the panelists for uh, very inspiring and insightful uh, statements and introductions before the panel. So on the occasion, I would like to invite all the panelists to turn on their cameras and join the, the panel discussion. Thank you very much. So the survey that we have seen at the, at the beginning of this um, uh, webinar has been quite uh, surprising and insightful and, and interesting, posing already a number of questions and revealing a clear need for more efforts concerning the sustainability in education in general. So with this in mind, we have already heard the, some of the remarks from the audience on the need to take on the survey and, and move back to the institutions with some of the questions. So an important question there is really, how can we proceed in this regard? Um, what are some of the steps that our institutions can really take to bring the sustainability in education further. I wonder, Natalie, if you would like to maybe comment on this. I would say that look for the resources that are out there, that there are many um, faculty members, institutions doing things around sustainable chemistry, green chemistry, um, and that you don't necessarily need to start from scratch, look to others that are doing things. And that's really what the commitment is about, I would say as well, um, but really, um, thinking about just how you can lead as an example, I would say within your institution. And there are many ways that you can do that. Maybe it's through curriculum or maybe it's in the way that you practice things in the lab and thinking about doing things in a little bit of a greener approach. Um, one thing I didn't mention and I'll just say is that you are an early career researcher and you are doing things at the bench. One way that you can start doing green chemistry principles is to thinking about doing things as a green labs program. So thinking about sustainability in your lab overall um, and just to kind of give a resource there, um, my green labs is a great resource that I know I use during my PhD studies to bring in the green chemistry that I didn't have within my institution. Um, so I would say find the resources and just start. That's a great remark. David, you would like to add something to that? 
Yeah, I think I think the other thing that you need is you need to have champions within each university department because if there's nobody who's really dedicated to this, it's not going to go anywhere. So you've got to find the right people who will then take it forward within that university setting. And you can yeah, be there, of course. No, I can yeah, starting with ourselves, <laughs> Juliana. No, I just can say from my experience, like, because whenever I started my degree, I didn't have, I didn't know about green chemistry or sustainable chemistry at all. And then I started, like, I read a book and it had one page about it. And then I was like, this is what I want to do. So I think it's just like, now we have more access to this kind of, of sustainability things in the internet everywhere. So I, I think that's a great way. Like, if you don't know anybody who is doing it, like Dave said, if you don't know any champion, you just like go for yourself and become your own champion. You do your thing. You also mentioned uh, the need for, for resources. Uh, uh, Emily, you mentioned that you have shared already and you have shared previously the link to also the results of the survey as one of the first questions that came up uh, really inspired this uh, uh, also question being whether people can now take back the, the, take this survey back to their own institutions and promote. Can you say something more about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, David is right. You need a champion to do that. But uh, there are a few things or two things, actually, that you need to realize. And uh, number one is uh, you don't have to be a researcher or expert in sustainable green chemistry at all to start acting. And the other one is um, that you have to realize it can be very easy to be distracted on uh, in this yeah, very relevant, uh, extremely uh, growing field that you uh, think you contributed something because you shared something or you communicated something, but in the end you have to uh, measure your actions. And uh, once you keep that in mind, uh, you can also make a change and then you can take up the responsibility, lead by example. And if you lead by example, then other people will follow. And I think the most important part about this is um, really realizing you don't have to be an expert and uh, it's okay to have some hypocrisy. Uh, you don't have to do everything perfect because uh, in the end, hypocrisy just shows that you uh, know what, what's right. And that's still better than not caring at all. So anyone can be the champion to forward this and uh, bring it to attention to several, there are a ton of committees inside and outside of educational organizations where mm -hmm. you can point this out and say, here, look at these results. You have it in your hands. You can look it up free of charge online and just bring it to the committees and show them what uh, young, people's, uh, young people need, what uh, industry needs, and uh, what the world needs. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a, a great point. It also relates to part of what I understood uh, from the commitment and from Natalie's remarks being that there are many different ways and many different levels to which one can contribute to making a difference. And we simply need to need to start and take some, some of these steps. But it also sounds a lot like we need to amplify and, and uh, some of these voices of some of these champions and, uh, and the activities that are already uh, present coming back also to the champions and as well as the resources. Uh, what do you think maybe Juliana as someone who has uh, given us more information about uh, about Nessie which sounds like a great community that is uh, that it is realizing this how important are these roles of communities and what can we do to to promote some of these actions in that regard Thanks Giovanna yeah so i feel like in terms of communities and networks, some people think kind of underestimated, like, okay, what can I do with my own people here, like in this small um, place? But um, like, for example, like the GCI, the Green Chemistry Initiative, Initiative sorry, um, they were a student group and they started to talk about green chemistry. They started to make videos. They started to talk to people and promote and social media and everything. And today the University of Toronto has a green chemistry department because of them. So I think mm. like, don't think that because you're, you're small and like, what can I do that things can do? And like, if you think about our society as a, as a big community, like if, like for example, everybody's like, no, 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 we won't use single plastics anymore, that's it. The industries will have to adapt. They will have to change things because the society is asking for them. So I think we can all like, we can make, we play a big important role and we all need to figure that out and, and do things. I think uh, 
I, I completely agree. And I think this really comes across strongly with how important these topics become uh, uh, over the recent past. And it also reminds me of uh, some of the points that you raised, David, uh, with some of the champions you highlighted who have really made the difference and, and pushed this further. So you have also mentioned in that context that one of the important components that has made this possible apart from the community is educating the public. Can you tell us more about this and the importance of this component? Yeah, I mean, I think in the end, it's going to be politicians who are going to have to make the difference and and we have to get them going. And, and the, the great thing about Greta Thunberg is she she bought into some, some psyche that everybody had, which the politicians hadn't realised. And then suddenly they suddenly thought, gosh, we actually are supposed to have zero emissions by 2050. We've really got to do something about it. So we need in the sustainability area, we need people like that. We need people who can come up and say, look, well, I think David Attenborough with the plastics is another example, and, and we need this in all the areas. And it's not just sustainable chemistry, of course, it's, it's this sustainability is a multidisciplinary thing, where you've got to have people working in all areas together. I mean, just to give you one example, ammonia is an enormously important chemical. It keeps two, billion people alive. So if we didn't have ammonia, two billion people would be dead. And yet it uses one and a half percent of the entire energy of the planet to make it, and five percent of all the methane, all of which is sent out as CO2. Now, we have to have it, but how can we have it sustainably? Well, we don't have to make hydrogen from methane, we can make it from water by electrolysis or photolysis. But nobody's doing that. Well, I think people are thinking about it now. We have to get messages like that out, which people suddenly say, wow, we really do have to do something. And these sustainable development goals, as I said earlier, are due to be done by 2030, 10 years. It's a huge challenge. And somehow we've got to get that message out to the public and then also into the schools and the universities. The, in, um, sorry, if I may just go on one little bit longer. Um, I think we've seen a great uh, change in America in the last uh, couple of weeks. And one of the things Joe Biden did the day before yesterday was to say that all of the cars run by the government in the United States will be electric. And it's 600,000 cars. Now, it's tiny compared with the number of cars, but it's a major impetus to saying this is what we've got to do but then you've got to turn around and say okay but each of those has to have a lithium battery with cobalt in it and lithium where are we going to get the lithium cobalt a lot of it comes from the democratic republic of the congo in mines which are run by children in awful conditions we've got to do this as a whole big round thing where everybody works together to try to get this um, sorted out in a so you want to become sustainable in a sustainable way. That's, that's important. And also considering all the stakeholders and, and, and uh, all the components. And I think this brings me also to an important question in general, but also a question of the audience. Maybe after Emil would like to comment. I just want to uh, quickly emphasize on the point that David made uh, about Greta Thunberg inspiring people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Actually, um, my journey started with her, if you if you want to say so, because uh, back when I started my PhD, I think with the beginning of 2019, there was this uh, big climate change demonstration day where uh, the whole world was demonstrating for climate change. And I found myself standing in the middle of those and listening and suddenly realizing that I am not in a position to tell other people to change something because at this point, I am well-educated as a scientist to start making the change. And so from there on, I went on, okay, what, where can I make a change? I wanna be more engaged uh, with the young chem chemists on a federal level, drive the change. And then in the end, uh, what happened is we have a team for sustainability and this, uh, this survey that will hopefully make a change someday and be implemented. Because at this point, it's still only communication, but we need to implement it now. So you have to be the Greta Thunberg of sustainability. Huh? <laughs> you have to be the Greta Thunberg of sustainability. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't say so. No. <laughs> <laughs>
but it's a great example. Thank you for sharing this uh, this story because it's in uh, it's a great story on how actually uh, uh, change is triggered and 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 moved into action. Yeah, uh, when... it inspires other people to uh, to realize the same that they're in the same position that they mm -hmm. should be asking for uh, someone else to do it. It seems that there is an important player in this uh, in this uh, landscape, and this is the chemical industry. Uh, there is also a question by the by the audience and questions that we received before. So I wonder, maybe Florian, you can tell us more. What do you think is the the role of chemical industry here, and especially from the perspective of sustainability education? Yeah, so so it's quite important so the chemical industry, of course, because all of most of the the, the people going through education are going into industry and working there, and they are motivated to transform the whole industry in sustainability. And the survey showed that they have the feeling they lack of some skills and so on. What we as a chemical industry could do is that we directly address this education um, system. What skills do we need or what seems too important for us? And that it's more like a general understanding of, of sustainability and that we not emphasize on specific disciplines in chemistry like Electrochemistry of put on, on hydrogen. Of course, it's a very important key technologies, but a general view on sustainability over the whole chemical departments would be great that everyone has an understanding what is sustainability. And it's not only CO2 emissions, so it's more like that, and that everyone has that like a kind of a mindset, and that would help us. So in a way, uh, communicating also these uh, these uh, needs of such skills to, to be developed. But can industry play a role also in developing these skills? Yes, of course, we could maybe start some some programs like internships or some, something like that, that we can set up and, yeah, some scheme where people, uh, I don't know, students can come and then we run through maybe summer school or like that, that we show what, what are our topics regarding sustainability, what are the urgent ones, and then we maybe can set up specific projects where students can work on that. And that, I think it's already happening with the new running. So some student programs are ongoing. They're doing like CO2 reduction roadmaps for some business lines. Yeah, that could be, could be one approach. Yeah, this is a good rem a great remark. Uh, Emilio, we, we would like to comment? Uh, yeah, obviously, I'm just a PhD student at the moment, so I'm not involved too too much in industry. But my feeling is that uh, industry is very focused on funding innovation and uh, sees that as supporting the youth in sustainable chemistry. But they're, uh, they're skipping a step here because I don't see a lot of involvement and in funding for educational programs. It's mostly when you ask them about it, they start rambling on about innovation. Yeah. And if you skip this step, you cannot innovate if you don't have the tools or the skills. So I think there's really something that uh, where industry has to change focus. Yeah, that's true. So we have the tools, but we don't have the people to, to, to use the tools or the technologies. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah. I, I will take it with me and then I <laughs> both that. Yeah, this is the importance uh, of the exchange uh, for, for people from yeah. different uh, domains and perspectives uh, in order to, to start the discussion on the important actions. Natalie, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just want to add that from Beyond the Nine's kind of viewpoint, we work with industry. So in terms of just our partners of like DuPont and Dow and Target are looking at they fund Beyond the Nine to work with faculty members to create resources, to create programs, to work with us with the Green Chemistry Commitment Program. For example, we have a partnership with Dow for the next year, and it's actively recruiting their partners that they recruit their talent from to recruit them to the Green Chemistry Commitment so that they know that their future workforce has heard the term Green Chemistry, that they know that is a piece of being a chemist, that they should use those skills to hit those sustainability goals for Dow. And so I see industry as supporting through through those programs um, and I just think that it's something that just needs to be a little bit wider spread um, if industry wants to hit their sustainability goals they'll have to educate um, the future workforce. David you wanted to add something to this? Yeah there are some wonderful examples of industry where they've moved over to sustainable methods from very unsustainable ways of making things 
And we've sometimes used those, or invited, sorry, used is a bad word, but we've invited those people to come and talk to our undergraduates about how it was done and so on. So it's not just us supplying them, it's them supplying us with good examples and, and showing that this really is real life stuff we're talking about. It's not some hairy fairy stuff we're thinking about that may happen in 50 years time. So the need for exchange, so that the responsibility on education is not only on the academic side, but shared um, across the sectors. Uh, several questions directly relate to that, uh, such as should the industry take the responsibility to lead the fight for sustainability? Maybe you can uh, comment on that, Florian. Or it seems that some of them we might have addressed, like how we should support some of them are resources and fundings, projects for exchange. What else do you, what do you think, Florian? Yeah, so I think the responsibility of the, is quite high for the industry because we are the ones who are doing the most damage and so yeah and we are forced from so we are forced to do it and we are yeah we are also motivated to do it by ourselves but a lot of pressure is coming from outside so there's a lot of people asking for sustainable solutions it's going through the value chain it's coming to the chemical industry and the good thing about the chemical industry is that we are wide in the top of the value chain that we have a lot in our own hands to design the product that are sustainable so yeah that's and this is a, also an important component uh, that it's really an interaction between the domains and sometimes these uh, aspects are we, we you have mentioned in several of your your statements the importance of reaching certain goals posed uh, by our policies and and governments like the 2030 and the 2050 goals at the moment within a number of uh, of, of countries and domains, but this really requires uh, um, effort through an exchange uh, of all the players. But what are your thoughts about uh, how can we contribute further or how much these uh, ambitious goals posed by our policies can actually be drivers for not only realizing them, but perhaps stimulating what you have mentioned, Florian, also is the, the need for, for, for new technologies perhaps. Uh, and stimulating also innovation, that this can be another source or a drive for really uh, proceeding for more sustainability education. Would you like to maybe comment on that? Were you addressing me? Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Okay. It's a very open question okay. to all of you. Okay. Yeah, so maybe another one can go ahead. <laughs> I don't want to. Are these just illusionary ambitious goals? Do you believe that we will reach these goals? And I mean, of course, sustainability in education can help, but can it really accelerate progress through, through all these activities? Do, shall we feel an imperative uh, and, and a pressure to, to really realize that uh, through making these transformations? Yeah, I think it's always, uh, would, would you wanna start, David? No, you carry on. You know. I think it's always important to have a well-educated uh, society. So everything starts with that. If, if you don't have a well-educated society, how can you make a change and understand what is changing about the world and uh, yeah, draw the right conclusions from there on. So um, right now, we obviously we have to do something in education as the survey also shows. Uh, I think your question was also in regard of uh, policies in general for sustainable development, because uh, we're, we're going towards goals that are for 2030 or 2050, and we cannot change the education system that quick. So we need alternatives and parallel initiatives. And I think it's really important for politics to start setting some incentives and really stimulating uh, a change. And politics really has the power to set these stimulations uh, with yeah, money, basically. Money, uh, money still rules the world, so if, uh, if anything, uh, is if you can change the profit uh, of sustainable solutions and uh, the yeah diminish the profit of non-sustainable solutions, I guess uh, you can see a big change also in sustainable development in industry. I agree. It's really setting the uh, the incentives for 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 the change. Uh, David, you would like to add something? Yeah, I think the problem with politicians, or one of the huge number of problems with politicians, is that they don't last very long. So they can set a target which they're never going to have to be involved in reaching. And they do it and they think, oh, great, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll cut our emissions to zero by 2050. 
I won't be bothered by then, so it'll be fine. But then if the public get behind it, then it becomes a much, much more important thing because then at the next election when they come up, then they have to answer to that. And that's why, again, go back to Greta Thunberg, because that, that Thunberg, that's how she has really appealed to people's minds. And I think we have to do that. In terms of education, though, I think you say is there's not time to sort it out. I do think that actually one of the ways to do it is through master's programs. So you do your undergraduate degree in a fairly traditional way, but then you do a multidisciplinary master's, which takes you into the areas that you need to be in. It's a very good, uh, interesting point, and it also then educates uh, 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 young experts early uh, in order to tackle some of these challenges. And I think these are important components in terms of the rate at which we are going and how we exchange and how we internalize some of these goals. And this is why this education reflects a lot on the public, and which are which actually is reflected on several questions as well in terms of. Uh, uh, the uh, educating the public, also questions that we have received uh, early on, which uh, which you have well uh, addressed so far in terms of what are the possibilities and setting examples. But an interesting question that just came across is that can any of these initiatives be disruptive? Uh, if, if so, how can we overcome barriers of disruptive innovation so that uh, these uh, solutions uh, unfold impact? Sorry, may I speak again? Mm -hmm. I think that yes, in, the, in the past, the general view has been that if we go to green chemistry, it's going to be more expensive. And in fact, that isn't the case very often. Sometimes the green chemistry solution is much cheaper. And especially the case if you've got to handle the waste that you're making by the old processes. So I think it can be. And uh, Martin asked a very, very good question here. Um, but you need to get that I mean, that is an industrial thing. They've got to realize that you can do something green, which is actually going to be cheaper or better or in some way an advantage to them commercially. And, and I think that that's, that's an awareness which has happened in many industries, actually, and is why we're seeing more processes coming in now. Uh, Emil? Yeah, I'd like to comment on that uh, again. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's true what you're saying. Uh, things can actually be cheaper if they're uh, even if they're green, and I think that is uh, something that the Green New Deal actually does quite well. Although I have to say I'm not uh, fully famil familiar with the Green New Deal or all of its aspects, nor am I a fan of how quickly it's progressing. But something that it does really well, and which we need more of, is really laying out the financial aspects of the change. And I think that is uh, something that is unique to this Green New Deal that is currently uh, put forward by the EU. And I guess also in the United States, there was an initiative by uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Ortez, if I'm not mistaken. So it's again coming back to incentivizing this change and also providing enough resources for it, for it to, make, uh, to, to be possible. But Natalie, you wanted to add something else? Yeah, I think I'll just add in there is that change is always going to be disruptive. Um, so I think making any change is going to cause that problem. But I think showing the impacts is the way that we get around that. Um, I know here in the States, one great way is through the Green Chemistry Presidential Challenge Awards, that is from industry and academia that highlights um, innovations that are green chemistry based and then shows the waste reductions and overall. So really connecting it to real world examples to show there really is an impact when you use these principles in the products and processes that we then create. And I just want to add to that kind of policy uh, statement, I guess, in terms of that this is a new way of thinking about how we do chemistry. And that so if we think about it as an innovation, it takes there's always going to be early adopters of the innovation, but to get to a mass capacity of people moving in that same direction will take policy. I really truly believe that. Um, but I think that there have been a lot of early adopters and great leaders in the space that can be looked at um, and followed after um, if you're interested in doing more in this space. And that I think policy will just push us to having more of that transformative um, future that we're looking for. This is a great point how the, in a way, disruption can stimulate innovation and uh, in that sense, uh, uh, stimulate 
creativity to 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 find uh, the different solutions to to some of these potentially at the moment disruptive uh, elements of the of the change. I think this is uh, this is also a very important question and and the point that we have uh, that also refers to one of the questions that have now disappeared from the chat after the technical issue. But one of the questions that emerges: What is the role of entrepreneurs in uh, in not just driving this change, but also in the context of uh, sustainability in uh, education. Uh, would you like to comment on that? I guess it relates to many of the topics that you have already touched upon, uh, uh, such as the, the perhaps also stimulating the having the resources and funding and, uh, and the role of industry. Is there anything else that we should perhaps consider in terms of the role of entrepreneurs? I'll just kind of say that I think that it's an exciting time to be thinking about being an entrepreneur as a chemist, that, that we realize that there aren't sustainable solutions out there and that you, if you're a chemist, you're trained in creating molecules, looking at processes and products. And if we want to do things in a better way, then chemists really are the ones that have the skills in order to do that. And so I see green chemistry as a way to invent new products and processes in that sustainability uh, framework that you, if we want to achieve that sustainable future, it has to be done with chemistry from the very beginning that is sustainable at that molecular level. And so innovation, I think, is directly connected to this new way of doing chemistry and that we can reinvent the products and processes that are around us so they have that reduced human health and environmental impact. And I think there's great examples of entrepreneurs that are working in the green chemistry space for sure. I agree. And I also believe that many of these uh, ambitious policies uh, that can be disruptive for a lot of industries, in fact, stimulate innovation. Uh, uh, David Jung have mentioned the very early days of the efforts to, uh, to have sustainable production of fuels and, and hydrogen, which is now even additionally stimulated by some of the existing uh, uh, policy initiatives that then provide additional funding for, for some of the, uh, the researchers to maybe realize this uh, potential and bring it to another level. I think these are good examples. Uh, I used to call it the fuel of the future, but it may be the fuel of the present now it would be good. It was the fuel of the past, of course, because gas, the gas we used to burn in cookers was made of a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So we know how to handle it, it's fine, but uh, it'd be really great to see it come in now as the fuel of the present. Made, That's, from, uh, the... made from water, not made from hydrocarbons, which is how it's been mm -hmm. done in the past. You know, there's a lot of talk about make, still making it from hydrocarbons and doing carbon capture and storage, which if it can work, is fine. But doing it from water with uh, electrolysis, for example, with overproduced electricity from wind and solar, that, that's going to be a major con contributor, I think. Well, this is, a, this is an important point, and I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned it and that these questions also stimulated additional uh, um, uh, ways of, of addressing this from acting. Uh, accordingly and, and be the, the driver of the change through connecting communities, uh, through in a way uh, finding additional resources for projects across academia and industry. There are many additional points to address and the objective of this uh, webinar was to really uh, become familiar with the results of the survey and the importance of really taking the steps uh, towards sustainability in education and I hope that this was uh, this is only the start and the beginning of this discussion that uh, continues and is hopefully transformed into some of the actions. So being mindful of the time, I use the opportunity to thank you all once more for contributing to this very inspiring and, uh, and enriching panel. And I look forward to the continuation of this uh, exchange. Thank you very much, Ivana and Max. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Before we... Um officially uh, close the session, I would like uh, to direct, direct your attention to just a few projects. I mean, we've already heard a lot, um, but a few projects that are carried out um, by UCAMS uh, or IYCN um, or partners um, currently. So first of, uh, first of all, there's uh, this session at the upcoming IUPAC uh, CCCE a virtual conference, which is replacing uh, the scheduled um, IUPAC conference in Canada. 
where there will be a session about the uh, UN uh, SDGs for the benefit of society and uh, contributions are still accepted there until the uh, 16th of March. So if anyone uh, also in the audience is uh, working on that field, uh, so potentially... Um, quickly interrupt, I think it's the 16th of February, actually. Um, uh, yeah, that's still the date on the website, but as, as far as I know, it will be extended by a month. Um, <laughs> so it should be the 16, uh, 16th of March uh, in a few days. Um, and then there's also the um, IYCN uh, SDG survey, to uh, find out how the IYCN members or general uh, individuals uh, are contributing uh, to these goals in their own work. Uh, and on the other uh, side, we also have the European Sustainability, uh, Sustainable Chemistry Award, uh, where the deadline of applications is in a few days. Um, and the Sustainable Chemistry Lecture Series that started, I think, exactly one week ago um, with uh, Professor Bella and Professor Cobre. Um, and will continue on the 15th of February. And uh, with that, I just want uh, to also thank all the panelists and uh, Giovanna from my side for, for their uh, interesting um, uh, views and, and comments and, and Giovanna for hosting the discussion and uh, hope uh, that you all stay healthy and have a, a nice rest of the day, uh, depending on uh, which time zone you're in. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>